Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another episode of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk with professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their career in and out of the ring, doing great works of uh, helping others, works of community service and charity work. That's kind of the theme of the show as long as well as their work in the ring. And I've got a very special guest with me today. She is, has wrestled all over the United States and Canada. She's now a coach at the Monster Factory up in Paulsboro, New Jersey. And she's also written a few wrestling books that you can find on Amazon. I'm very pleased to welcome to the show, Missy Sampson. How are you doing today? Yeah, how you doing? Good, good. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Tell me about your childhood. Where did you grow up, Missy? I grew up in a suburb just outside of Philadelphia uh, called Abington. Um, very small, middle class, you know, suburban neighborhood. Uh, parents divorced when I was four. Uh, I have three full-blooded older sisters. I do have a half-sister from my dad's first marriage that I didn't meet till I was like 30. Um, so I was the youngest of four girls growing up. My dad got primary custody of all of us. And uh, yeah. Goodness gracious, four years old. Parents divorced. That's That had to be tough, I'm sure. No. It, you know, it's so funny because, you know, I knew other kids growing up whose parents had gotten divorced and they wanted their parents to get back together. And I never wanted that. Really? My parents were miserable together. Hmm. So, like, I never wanted my parents to get back together. Like, I was fine with the divorce. <laughs> wow. And then years later, my dad remarried my stepmom, who to me became my mother, um, who unfortunately is no longer with us. She passed um, in 2008 of pancreatic cancer. I'm so Um, sorry. But thank you. But that opened up. I mean, she was an angel of a woman, um, the best mother I could have ever asked for. So without that divorce, I wouldn't have gotten her. That's good that you you were able to develop that relationship um, with your stepmom. You know, it's always good to have that mother uh, figure um, in your corner. Um, So what exactly got you into professional wrestling? So I'm going to psychoanalyze this for you. Um, So again, I was the youngest of four living with my dad. Pardon me. Uh, My dad owned his own business at the time. So it's not like he was home a lot. Um, So there wasn't a lot of time with dad growing up, but he enjoyed professional wrestling. So, you know, he'd get home or whatever and put it on. And and I kind of think somewhere in my psyche, I went, well, if I want to spend time with dad, let me hop up here and get into what he's into. So that's, you know, that's what happened. You know, I started watching wrestling with my dad and, you know, fell in love. I like that because that's kind of how I got into it as well. I was just, you know, a little kid at home. My dad's got the TV on and he's watching Raw and we just bond right, right away, you know. Yep. So there's nothing like having, you know, seeing like larger than life personalities like The Rock on television and you're just you know, immersed in just seeing, like you know, watching real life superheroes do battle. Yeah. That's a great way of putting it, you know, in real time too, you know? Yeah. And getting a, an elongated story out of it, not like just a movie, but every week you can tune back in and see what happens next. Somebody put it once that it's like wrestling's like a real life comic book, you know, yeah. it's, it's weekly episodic television with good guys, bad guys, baby faces, heels. Um, and you're just, you know, you're caught in this, this, you know, drama, the suspense that you're tuning in and watching and you're just invested. Yes. You know, and as a wrestler, that's, that's the goal is to get the fans emotionally invested in what you're doing. Mm Mm-hmm. Why do you feel like it's important to get invested in, in something like professional wrestling? As a, as a fan, um, it's an escape. You know, it's a, it's a step back from whatever might be going on in your life. You know, whether it's, you know, a, a three hour TV program, I think that's what they're up to now. Yeah. Or whether you go to a two hour indie, 
it's getting out of your own head and just enjoying something um, being presented in front of you and, you know, possibly doing it with characters that you can relate to. You know, I, I always said growing up, I had two favorite wrestlers, Bret Hart and Dusty Rhodes. Uh, Bret Hart, because he's Bret Hart and I shouldn't have to say anymore, but, you know, for him, you know, for me, he was the technical greatest um, wrestler, but for Dusty Rhodes, I related to him. He reminded me of my dad. So, you know, I'll tell you this funny story. I had to have been maybe eight, nine years old. And my dad's office was behind our living room. And I was watching wrestling and it was Dusty Rhodes versus Tully Blanchard with Colonel Robert Parker. It was a first blood match. And uh, Tully came to the ring with Colonel Parker, had, you know, had gear on. Russ like, you can't do that. And then, you know, uh, Colonel Parker starts rubbing Vaseline. And Russ like, you can't do that either. Makes my wipe it off. So they start having this match. And at some point, my dad comes out of his office to go to the bathroom. Goes to the bathroom and the finish occurs while my dad's in the bathroom. Oh, no. And, and the finish is um, the ref gets bumped. Dusty Bionic elbows Tully, busts him open. Ref doesn't see it. Dusty goes over to wake the ref. Colonel Parker, hand, you know, wipes off Tully's head, hands him a sock full of nickels. He wallops Dusty with it. Dusty bleeds. Ref sees it, says Tully wins. I start ugly, hysterical crying in the living room. I'm sitting like in the middle of the living room floor, Indian style, ugly, hysteric, sobby cries. So my dad comes out of the bathroom and goes to go back in his office and hears me sobby crying and stops and looks in the living room at me. And he's like, what's the matter? And through like hyperventilating, I'm like, well, does he? And, and, and totally cheated. And, and, and the rep, like, you know, I'm, I'm giving, trying to give him the explanation and he starts laughing at me and he goes, can we curse on here? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. He goes, you know, that shit's fake, right? I instantly stopped crying. I was in such shock. I like went numb. I stopped crying. I stood up. I stopped my foot at him and I said, you don't say that to me. And I went to my room and slammed my door and didn't talk to my dad for two weeks. Oh man. That's, that's, that's unbelievable. It's even it's, more hysterical was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I got to tell that story to Tully Blanchard. <laughs> I'd worked a couple of shows with his daughter Mm -hmm. told her the story yeah and then he came That's to a... one of the shows to see her and she, the minute he got there she came to get me and she goes you have to tell my dad that story you have to so i did and he thought it was great that's that's hilarious you got your start in at 16 years old wow that's that's crazy you know amazing what your parents will let you do ah true you know you can you, you know you can do anything real you quick before my dad gets a before my dad gets a bad rep uh so when i was 16 i moved out of his house moved in with my biological mom and i was allowed to do whatever i wanted that's how that worked <laughs> <laughs> wow okay okay all right so you started training at 16 you know and as we've talked about you know wrestling is not easy it's it's very it's very not. very hard you know just like anything else in the entertainment or sports world, it's very hard to break in. Uh, tell me about what the training process was like for you in getting started in, in the wrestling Grueling. business. Well, I should start off by saying that I didn't even know indies existed at all. Um, prior to me moving from my dad to my biological mom's house, I had fallen asleep cooking and caught my dad's house on fire. Uh, so for three months, we had to live in an apartment nowhere near my neighborhood. And again, I didn't drive, I didn't have a car, so I sat in the apartment most of the summer. And I found ECW and uh, started watching that religiously. And then my sister mentioned that one, a girl we went to high school with, like, goes to all the shows, knows all the guys. And as fate would have it, about a week and a half later, I ran into that girl. I hadn't seen her in years. Ran into that girl in the food court of the mall. I was having lunch with my mom. And uh, she came over to say hello. And I'm like, oh, my God. You know, Rose said that you go to EC, Rose is one of my sisters. You go to ECW, you know, all the guys, she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I'll take you, da, da, da. So uh, around this time I was moving, I was bouncing back and forth between my parents' houses. 
and my dad would say I could go to an ECW show and then would like two days before the show would find a stupid reason to ground me so I couldn't go. Um, but I ended up eventually going, uh, which was fantastic. Everyone was super cool. Um, met a couple of people. Uh, and then the girl that I went with got asked to do an indie show in Philly um, by Angel Amoroso, who worked for ECW at the time. So me, my mom, and her went down. My mom drove us. And we did the show. And then as customary after indie shows, everyone goes out to eat. So we were all went out to eat. We were at this long table. And I was sitting like one person over and across from Angel Amoroso. And we were all eating and my mom happens to throw up. Now, this was before women's wrestling was like, you know, there were 90 bajillion female wrestlers. At the time, there were only maybe three or four in the tri-state area. My mom mentioned that I'd always wanted to wrestle. And Angel was like, wait, really? She's like, I'll train you for free just to have somebody else to take with me to work. So that's how I started training. There was a wrestling gym that we all called Hawkins. Um down in Philly. It was a two-car garage, and there was always a broken down car in one bay and a broken down ring in the other. We used to have to weld the ring before we could work out, and I was, Angel took me there like twice, and then stopped coming with me, and I was left to my own devices, but it was all men. I was the only girl, and training was being run by uh, a guy named Flex Wheeler, um, and I was segregated shall we say um they taught me how to bump and that took forever because it's which in wrestling is fall safely that took me forever um but they would never really teach me a lot of anything else i was everybody else was like crash test dummy um they would all circle up in the ring and stretch and stuff and i always had to stretch on the floor outside the ring like i was kept for about three months i got i got beat up three times a week for three months and then I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I, I walked in after three months and they were all circled up in the ring and I started stretching on the outside and Flex looked over at me and started laughing and shook his head and he goes, you're not going anywhere, are you? And I go, no, sir. He's like, all right, then. He's like, everybody back up, make some room for her. So it was like a three month initiation just to make sure. And I get where they were coming from. They had had other girls come in for like a week and then quit. And that's a waste of their time. Um, so I hated it for those three months, but, you know, but I'll tell you, it did a lot for me. It taught me to persevere. It also taught me how to protect myself in a ring. Um, you know, so I hated it for those three months, but I'm in the end thankful for it. That's good. You know, it's that never say die, never give up attitude. And it seems like it was ugly for a couple of months. Well, I'll tell you the the first the, after the first day of training where they were trying to teach me how to fall properly, I went to bed. I woke up the next day and couldn't sit up in bed. I had like blown all the muscles in my neck. And uh, I had to cut the back of my neck and do a sit up. Once I got in an upright position, my head was fine, but I didn't have the muscle strength to even lift my head off the pillow. Oh, geez. Wow. Two yeah. ibuprofen, some heating pad and... I was back in training that night. Wow. You just have to really train your body to, to be conditioned, not just to get in shape, but like actually, you know. Well, in shape, what people think is in shape and ring shape are two totally different things. Why do you, th why do you think that is? It, well, a lot of it is um, the physicality of what we do. You know, I've had people come in that are marathon runners and blow up in a ring in three minutes because the cardio you need in the ring is a lot of, start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, as opposed to just good cardio. Mm. Um, you know, you need to have good balance, um, good hand-eye coordination, uh, you know, stuff like that to be a pro wrestler. You got your training, you know, you've, you've you started wrestling. Who were like some of the, the opponents that you look back on who, that you enjoyed working with, being in the ring with? Uh, my favorite opponents, uh, Sumi Sakai. Mercedes Martinez, La Rosa Negra, Mickey Knuckles, Cindy Rogers, Annie Social, who ended up being my tag partner, is my best friend. Uh, Gabby, Gabby Gilbert. Uh, 
I mean, off the top of my head, those are the ones that stick. Uh, Jana. A girl wrestled in uh, New Jersey. She was trained by IWF named Jana. Was okay. one of my faith. She was one of the people I didn't. Oh, and Casey Carlisle. Jana and Casey Carlisle ended up being the two girls that I didn't have to talk to in the back if we had to wrestle. We were like, what match are we? You know, how much time do we have? Who's winning? Great. And we would just see each other out there. So you retired from wrestling. And, you know, as you've talked about, you started coaching. Uh, what, you know, what led you to start thinking about, gee, you know, I want to teach people, you know, and give back and, and train the next generation. I didn't. <laughs> So I had my, my scheduled last match, November, 2019. Uh, and I was, I was done. I walked away. I didn't want to coach. I was good. I liked my weekends back. Um, sitting around on my couch, beginning of 20, 2020 hits, COVID rolls in. Mm -hmm. So does speaking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I had met Danny Cage one time, I think at that point, maybe twice. Um, but when you're in wrestling long enough, everybody knows everybody, whether you've met them or not. Um, but we were friends on Twitter and he hit me up and sent me a DM and said, Hey girl, what's your phone number? Um, I'm going to call you and I need to talk to you about something. So I gave it to him. Uh, and he called me and he said, Hey, have you ever given any, uh, any thought to coaching? And I said, no. And he's like, Hey, yeah. So Ricky Reyes is going to come on and coach with me. And, you know, I was, I was hoping you would consider coming on too. And I said, oh, I said, you know, I've, I've trained with Ricky Reyes. You know, I've gone to some of his training classes. Ricky Reyes has an amazing ability to break down every maneuver to the smallest shift mm. of your foot. Mm. I said, I'm no good at that. You know what I'm saying? I said, if you teach him, I can clean it up, but I'm no good at breaking stuff down. And he goes, no, no, it's fine. He goes, we all bring something different to the table. And he goes, think about it. And I thought about it. And I, you know, I talked to some friends and I said, all right, I'll give it a try. And it's now 2023 and I coach once a week. So <laughs> that's good. You know, you've, yeah. You know, and I hear, uh, I hear Gabby Ortiz actually put the bug in his ear that was like, Hey, you know, cause this was when people were talking about how there weren't enough women in power positions in wrestling. Mm -hmm. And Gabby Ortiz went to Danny and was like, Hey, have you ever thought of, um, you know, bringing Missy on as a coach? And Danny's like, yeah, I've been thinking about it. And then when we announced that I was coaching there, I got a message from Kevin Kelly who goes, oh my God, he beat me to it. I was going to tell Danny that he should ask you to coach there. So, you know, it's great because you have that balance. You have, you know, the male perspective, but also you have the female perspective and, you know, it's good to have a mix of, of everybody around. So, you know, how, you know, women's wrestling can work and different techniques uh can be shared with you know with someone that you, you can relate to and you've had just an amazing career you know you travel around the world you know go to different countries and it's not just the it's not just the stuff you do in the ring but outside of the ring too uh, what stuff uh can you tell me like that you've kind of taught your students about you know taking care of yourself you know well, most of them work out and eat better than I do these days. <laughs> these days. Um, you, you know, for me, it's all about having some sort of, of release, right? I like volunteering in my community. Um, you know, one of the things I'm most passionate about that, you know, you and I had talked about before the interview was um, I volunteer at a place called the Westchester Food Cupboard in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a not-for-profit food cupboard. Um, where they are open certain hours and, and once a month, the, those in need in the community can come in, sign up. I don't know what the paperwork's like, um, but I'll go there, you know, at, at, you know, quarter after eight on a Saturday morning and bag up, you know, some produce and stuff. And then when the doors open, you know, uh, it's set up almost like a mini grocery store, oh, oh, okay. uh, which is why I love it. And like you get a shopping cart, we put a bunch of paper bags in it. And we walk, you know, we walk you around and your paperwork tells us how many people are in your house. And that denotes how many of each section you can take from. Oh, okay. but instead of just giving them random bags of food, they get to go in and actually shop. They get to pick out what they want from each section. We put it in a bag, we weigh it and off they go. That's very interesting. I, you know, how that, how that process kind of works. 
Well, when I was 19, I was living in an apartment by myself I couldn't afford. And I had to use a food cupboard to get food a few times. So I know what that's like. And that's when I, I you know, a, a friend of mine was on the board there, which is how I started volunteering there. And I said to him, you know, after the first two times I volunteered there, that was one of the things I loved most about it was there's a slight indignity to it in asking for that kind of help. But at the Westchester food cupboard, like you get a cart, I walk you around, you pick what you want. We bag it and what, like, so they have a choice. It's trying to normalize it for them to take a little bit of that shame away. Yeah. That's very nice. It's very awesome that you get a chance to do that oh, i love i love it i love the people like the people i've met that come in they're some of the greatest people why are you so passionate about helping in your community because i've the people that i help whether it's wrestling or the people that come to the food bank those are positions i've been in right so, so i know what it feels like to be in their shoes and if there wasn't people there to help me I wouldn't be where I am in my life. So for me, it's important to pay it forward, you know, and, and can, you know, and give back the way that people helped me. I'm one of those people that I, you know, I think we all get further in life. If you pull other people up with you, you know, you don't stand higher by, you know, stepping on people to get yourself there. I think the world in general would do better if everyone just kept trying to pull each other up with them to get to the next mm -hmm. level. Mm-hmm. You know, so, so that's why, you know, that's why I coach. That's why I, you know, volunteer in my community. Um, because I've, I've been in those people's shoes and people were there to help me. And now I'm in a position where I can help these people. And, and you know, I think I should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's well put. I mean, you're, you're passing the torch to the next generation of of talents and are giving back to people that are, you know, less fortunate, um, helping out at, at the, at the, um, the food center. And it, you know, I, I get this, I'm, I'm at the stage in my life now where when someone I know wins, my soul explodes, like we won, you know, you know, when I see somebody get an opportunity that I didn't get or, you know, gets to do something, it, my soul almost feels like we get to go along too, mm -hmm. you know? So, I, you know, when I see my friends succeed now, like I'm, you know, at home cheering them on um, and it feels good. You know, I, I'm not worried about, I'm good in my life. Yeah, as it should. Well, Missy, I just want to say thank you very much for coming on. Thank it you. means a lot. Yeah. And before we go, where can people find you on social media, find more about the Monster Factory? You can find me uh, on Instagram. It's Wrestling Missy and the number one. Uh, it's Wrestling Missy um, on Twitter. Um, I have a Missy Sampson Facebook page. Look, I'm hardly on it. I'm just going to be honest. Uh, Monster Factory, you can find on Instagram. It's at the number four Monster Factory, and it's the same on Twitter. And uh, if anybody's interested in, you know, we have shows once a month now, uh, come join us. Um, they're great shows. Uh, I'm blessed to get to coach and train just the greatest group of men and women. That's great. That's and Stanley, thank you for having me. Yeah. It's, it, and listen, you're more than well, you're welcome and you're more than welcome to come back. Oh, please. I'll be back. Yes. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.